For those of you who are not aware, Don is this morning in a TV production. And so as the alternate bass in the box, this is John Colazar, and I'm surrounded by presidents and former presidents, not of the United States. With us today, we have Charlie Kelly, president of the Arizona Big Game Super Raffle. Good morning, Charlie. Morning, John. We have Chris Denham, former president of the Arizona Deer Association and executive producer of the Western Hunter TV show. Good morning, Chris. Good morning, sir. And the current president of the Arizona Sportsman for Wildlife Conservation, Jim Anmacht, also known as Fabio. <laughs> Good morning, Johnny. <laughs> These gentlemen have been kind enough to give up part of their Sunday mornings to come down and chat with us. And the reason for it, we're doing a continuation of last Sunday's show in which we discussed the Mexican gray wolf ad nauseum and at length with Doyle Shumley from Springerville, Arizona. And what I wanted to do was bring in all three of them because they each have different areas of expertise. Charlie, of course, raises funds for us for the Arizona Big Game Super Raffle, which I want to touch on and cover. Um, Chris has more experience through the northwest and the western portions of the United States than most people I know. And Jimmy is probably the most uh, cerebral of all of us, politically correct and knows the areas of expertise that we look for, and that is how do we fight something like this in the most expeditious and legal manner. Johnny, I have my tennis shoes on today, not my boots. Not your boots, <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, Charlie, first and foremost, you have been the president of the Arizona Big Game Super Raffle, and I'd like you to tell people how hard it is and what we do in that, because I'm part of it as well. Uh, yeah, John, it's, it's really a fantastic um a program. It, it, it's a spin-off of the special tag program that began back in 1984. It started off real simple with just two desert bighorn tags, and those two tags raised 146,000 back in '84. Um, since that time, the programs evolved, and currently, the Game and Fish Commission is awarding 30 special big game tags every year. That's three each for all 10 of the big game species in Arizona. And that qualifies turkey, it qualifies javelina, buffalo, etc., correct? Yep, yep. All 10 of our big game species, we've got quite a few here in Arizona. Um, since that time in 1984, it's phenomenal, but it's raised um, a little bit over $20 million since that time. Uh, last year in 2012, it raised over a million and a half dollars, and it just seems to keep ratcheting up every year. It's the the big surprise this year was one of the elk tags sold for Chris what three hundred and three hundred and ninety five thousand three ninety five yeah. goodness it yep. was it was a staggering number yeah and uh, the the yeah. two mule deer tags I think sold for two hundred and forty and two hundred and forty five thousand yeah, yes we record. did on that one yeah new record yep yeah so with those two pairs of tags alone that's gosh one point one million dollars and there's still quite a few more that that get added up on top of that. Uh, the Super Raffle began back in, in 2006. It's been running for seven years now. And it, it fluctuates a little bit, but it generally raises right out of a half million dollars a year for those 10 big game tags. And, and the money is well spent. Um, the organizations that handle these special tags are all, all um, done with volunteers, so there's no overhead or any expenses. And 100% of the money that's raised goes right back to the Game and Fish Department. And they've got a organization or committee called the Habitat Partnership Committee. They call it the HPC. And they get together several times a year and decide how that money is going to be divvied up and, and put on the ground for wildlife here in Arizona. And I'm part of that, The one of the HPCs, which is the Pace and Natural Resources Committee. We meet quarterly. And between the ranchers and the Game and Fish Department and the Forest Service, they present <clears throat> what they call opportunities for involvement or projects on the ground that they would like to see. Uh, we know as we sit at the table that there's a whole lot of things that go into preparing a project, and most of these are fairly costly, from water tanks that cost upwards of fifty, sixty thousand dollars 60000 to um, tree thinning to controlled burns. Uh, those are all things that we look at. Charlie, how do we pay for that 
Now, obviously, I'm part of it in terms of the mailing. Why don't you explain how we do that mailing stuff? Well, um, the nice thing about it, which I touched on earlier, was 100% of the money um, goes back to Game and Fish. It costs us upwards of seventy, eighty thousand a year to administer that raffle, and that's the challenge: is to come up with the money to pay for the marketing and still give 100% of the money back to Game and Fish. Luckily, Swarovski Optics of North America has generously sponsored a, a really nice optics package each year, and that has really been the cornerstone of financing this this super raffle. We've also had a couple outfitters work with us in recent years, and we've been offering incentive elk hunts in New Mexico. And the combination of raffling off that elk hunt and then the Swarovski Optics raffle raises enough money to, to fund the marketing, and that way we can give 100% of the money back to wildlife here in Arizona. It's really a, a win-win for everybody. And, you know, the, the, the dollars involved at that, you know, half a million dollars that we raise or the 400000 that goes immediately back to the department, that's the substantial amount of money on the ground, which is really necessary because of the lack of water and, and habitat that we have here in Arizona for all wildlife. Um, one of the things that we're looking at, too, is, is that this plays right into the fact that if we're raising all that money specifically for big game species, but it benefits all wildlife, the counterproductive issue that we have or faced with when we're saying we're going to expand the current Mexican gray wolf program from 100 to the, in theory, meta packs that we we're talking about. And Jim, I'm going to put it in your lap now. Well, thank you, John. We've talked ad nauseum about going after um, how to stop this process. What have you heard and what's, what's in the air these days? Well, to start with, I think it's uh, unfortunate that sportsmen uh, do a lot of complaining but aren't very effective when it comes to stopping or minimizing the things that they're concerned about and have a problem with. Uh, in many respects, their growl is a lot louder than their bite. And then you throw in the fact that uh, a lot of people don't want to get involved Mm -hmm. They like to complain. Gee, I wonder if that's not 90% of the hunters in Arizona. Yeah. Unfortunately, it's a it's a ex terrible problem with sportsmen. Um, they want to draw their tag. They want to go hunting. They want to go fishing. But they don't want to get on the ground. They don't want to uh, get in the fight. And they don't want to stick up for literally what is their passion and lifeblood. Yeah. So when a program like the Mexican Gray Wolf comes along, and uh, 20, 30 years ago, uh, they decide they want to uh, keep a species from becoming endangered. Or extinct. Uh, or extinct. Extinct first, endangered second. Hmm. Uh, they decide they're going to have a, a 10J area for them, which is a, uh, an experimental population uh, with boundaries set aside that literally is going to allow the animal to uh, survive and they target a certain amount of uh, numbers and say it's going to cost X amount of dollars and 15, 20 years later uh, the government spent about $25 million. We have, uh, we just got a population estimate of 75 wolves. Uh, a lot of people don't believe that's the correct number. They believe there's more than that. Yeah. Uh, so in the meantime, while sportsmen are sitting around complaining they don't like wolves and other uh, uh, users of the land, some users of the land, complain about uh, the impact on their livelihood, uh, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service has put together a couple different committees. One's a science, and, uh, a science team, and then there's a recovery team, I believe. And behind closed doors, in many respects, they are trying to figure out a way to, quote-unquote, save the wolf, Mexican gray wolf. Uh, rumor has it that the projected 10J area is going to be expanded or they want to expand it. Uh, right now it's confined to the blue primitive area over in northeast Arizona and parts of uh, northwest New Mexico. But uh, some of the expansion they're talking about is all the way to I-17, all the way south to I-10, and potentially up to the Grand Canyon. Uh, some would like to. Some of the wolf folks would like to see it on the north rim of the Grand Canyon. Um, so you've got a lot of issues there. 
uh, one of the big things is how are you going to pay for all of this? Oh, yeah. I mean, I know the initial estimates that they had in the environmental <clears throat> draft environmental impact statement that Fish and Wildlife put out was the whole program over the life expectancy to get to 100 wolves was going to be $8 million. Right. And we know it's over 25 and probably over 30, 30 million. So you do the math, 25, 30 million, 75 official wolves, but that doesn't include wolves that uh, may be on the San Carlos Reservation. That doesn't include wolves that have gone off the 10J area. Uh, doesn't include wolves that they don't know they're, that are there because they're young that were not collared. Or counted, yeah. Or counted. Yep. Uh, so there's a lot of variables in there. Uh, the, the key is that uh, sportsmen need to be involved and need to do, do more than just complain about the wolf program. And uh, Arizona Sportsman for Wildlife Conservation uh, and its member groups are looking into what we can do as organizations uh, more than just complain. Um, and some of that view is being uh, some of the the options that are being researched track with what the environmentalists and protectionist groups are doing, and they have utilized the Equal Access to Justice Act uh, through the court system uh, to not only stop and control and uh, monitor and have an impact on a lot of these programs, but in the process they've had their legal fees covered. That is where we're going to go. We're going to have to take a break now. Thank all our sponsors. Thank Big Bass Daddy for giving us this opportunity. We'll be back. Oh, shit. That is such a nice rip. Thank you. Stevie's the bomb, isn't he? Oh, yeah. (laughs) All right, we're back at it. And one of the things I wanted to direct people to, and it's fairly interesting, if you go to the website, Shake, Rattle, and Troll, www.shakerattleandtroll.com, Right underneath the logo, there is an invitation to a symposium this coming Friday night. And of all places, the lively metropolis of downtown Springerville, where they're going to have a huge discussion, and they have three biologists coming in to explain the unique circumstances of the Mexican gray wolf. And this is where I think we're going to have some contention, Jimmy, and that is, is are these truly Mexican gray wolves? Are they slash dog hybrids? And where are they going to go with this genetic base that they're trying to achieve when only seven were known to be in existence at the time that it started? Yeah, that's the that's the underlying biggest problem that uh, the Mexican gray wolf has is that when you only have seven uh, parents, if you will, uh, there's only so many genetic variations you can get out of that seven uh, without literally stumbling over the genes. And uh, kind of like the family tree that doesn't fork. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And we won't name any particular areas of the country. No, no, uh, no, no, no. But uh, that's the problem. Um, so with those genetic limitations, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and the biologists that they have employed are trying to diversify this species as much as they can under the parameters they're dealing with. And, uh, you know, that doesn't include any... Uh, domestic canine genes or any other genes. That's just purely what they consider uh, the seven original pure strain Mexican gray wolf. And that species. is, again, that's something that we're going to probably look at. All right, let's go over to you, Mr. Denham. Mm-hmm. You travel the north, west, the west, all northwest, etc. What are you seeing out there in terms of the other states and how they're reacting to what was at that time a proliferation of wolves that came out of Canada. I call them Canadian gray wolves. What are they calling them up there? Yeah, Yellowstone wolves. You know, that's where most of them, the, the wolves through Wyoming, Montana, and that country that are that are covering up that country right now are coming out of Yellowstone. But they originally came out of Canada. They were brought down in, to Yellowstone from Canada. Oh, that was the place where they were going to take no less than 5%, no more than 30% of that Yellowstone herd that's now down over 80%. 80%. Yeah, in fact, you've probably seen, if you're on Facebook, you've probably seen the billboards that Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation has up in the Yellowstone Gateway country. I haven't seen that. Yeah, they've got a big billboard up. There's an uh, elk uh, cow with a calf and saying that you know the elk herds are down 80% in this country. If you care, go to rmef.org, and, and then there's a story of, of the elk population in that country. And what's happened up there. How is the RMEF becoming involved with that? 
You know, mostly from an educational standpoint now. Of course, they're, they're, they're starting to become more politically active. I think even RMEF is starting to recognize the fact that you can't can't stand when, by the wayside. Just be a good guy because you get stepped on. Yeah, you I mean a face? Uh, you know, a website's not going to not going to change this, but no. it's going to take action in Washington. It's going to take action at the state level. So they're finally starting to come on to that and doing a. Gr- they're doing a really good job, I think, at this point of educating the the hunting public and in this case the non hunting public. That's the you key. Know? Yeah, I saw some of the billboards that the wolf enthusiasts were putting up, and they were almost immediately removed where they were um, basically trying to tell the public that these poor gray wolves were being destroyed by hunters. Right, and this old billboard campaign from Army F was a direct response to that billboard campaign. And what happened to the the wolf pro campaign? I, I just saw that they were removing them quickly. Yeah, it was just a lot of pressure on the whoever the uh, the billboard owners are, you know, to to in the, especially in that country, you know. It's, you think? It, yeah, it's it's a tough country up there. But really, I think what they're starting to see. In, in that part of the country, as, as, as well as what we need to keep our eyes on down here is that the wolf in that country was not, is, what they're starting to figure out is that the wolf is not, the wolf is, is part of the problem, but it was the straw that broke the camel's back. Right. I mean, the, 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 they have huge problems up there with winter range. They've got huge problems with proliferation of grizzly bears and a non-hunted population of grizzly bears, uh, black bears, uh, coyote populations just like we have down here. You know, there are coyote populations that are out of control in some areas and unmonitored in every area. And they're starting to see that the, the wolf, once they drop that that tertiary predator, that top-end predator, put one more in there, and all of a sudden, boom, everything crashed. Well, I know that for the longest time, Grizz was happy to, uh, to feast on moose calves. And since the moose population's been declining so much up there, and almost in some places it's you know, gone, um, they're having to revert to elk, and now all of a sudden there's a combination fight going on. Oh yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a it's a stair, you know, it's an escalating problem. I mean, especially in in that country, and it's the same thing I think we see down here too. You know, we get a, a mountain lion, a mountain lion comes in and kills a deer. Well, the mountain lion killed the deer, but the wolf came in the day after the mountain lion killed the deer and cleaned that carcass up. Now the mountain lion's got to go kill another deer because the food source that she or he thought he had for a week is now gone. So now he's got to go kill another deer. The, wolf, the mountain lion gets blamed for the for the you know for the, the increased deer kill, and and the wolf is the is the nice uh, scavenger that just cleaned up the little mess the mountain lion made. But the reality is, you know, now the mountain lion's got to go kill another deer. Same thing in that country up there. You know, a grizzly bear kills something, the wolf comes in and cleans it up. Now the bear's got to go kill something else, and it just keeps you know it just keeps building on itself. That was one of the premises I read in the in- environmental impact statement was that the uh, coyote population was going to be whacked out of shape because. The wolves were going to take care of them, but I've, from everything I've seen, it's not happening. No, it's that, that was that was a big it was a big sales pitch by the you know the pro wolf crowd was that oh yeah you guys are worried about coyotes these wolves are going to come in and displace a lot of these coyotes and take care of this coyote problem for you and there's not been a shred of evidence that that's ever happened. Anybody that's watched coyotes run around downtown Phoenix, you know, you realize that coyotes are a heck of a lot smarter, and I'm sure a lot smarter than these inbred wolves are. Oh yeah, no doubt about that. All right, Jim. And, Charlie, we've got a meeting this Wednesday night, coming Wednesday night. Uh, Charlie, are you going to be there for that one? Uh, I hate to say it, John. I'm not sure which one you're referring to. It's Tuesday. To. Oh, I knew that. It's Tuesday okay, night? Just, keep, just mm-hmm. keeping you in line. Oh, at least somebody's doing that. Yeah. Thank you. It's over at Bass Pro. Yes. Want to tell us a little bit about it? Well, we've actually got uh, two individuals coming to speak. Uh, we've got a regional biologist from National Wild Turkey Federation coming at 5.30 for those that are interested. He'll talk for half an hour about some of the conservation uh, projects and uh, issues that NWTF is working on. Uh, his name is Scott Larich, and uh, he'll he'll go till 6. At 6.15, we have Ryan Benson coming on, and he's uh, with Big Game Forever out of Salt Lake City. And Ryan's going to talk to us about uh, what we can do to uh, counter some of these problems and issues outside of just complaining. Well, one of the things we're seeing now, too, though, and it's fascinating, There's, it's like instead of just a single front, and Big Game Forever tried to do that, and I think we're going to follow a little bit their path, or at least I would encourage people to do that. But we see now with Doyle what he's doing up there, and that is the county rebellions where the counties that are most affected are saying to themselves and to the world at large, we're not going to take it anymore. Um, They're creating 
um, special um, ordinances. They're making sure that the sheriff's office are deputized to the degree that they will go out, and if there is a problem, Wolf, and they encounter it or they're called in on it, they go out and they dispatch that particular problem, Wolf. And the counties across the United States, I think, are getting tired of the fact that urban dwellers are determining their lifestyle when they have no right to do that because they are not part and parcel of the process. And that's going to get into some interesting conversations, I think, in the future where the federal government and the mass population, which knows nothing about what goes on in the land, is making a determination for those people who protect, live, thrive, and try and eke out an existence in those particular areas. Feel free to comment. Yeah, in fact, I was just up in Oregon two weeks ago in, uh, in, in eastern Oregon, and Oregon is a classic example of that. I mean, Oregon, you've got Portland, Portland and Eugene yep. pretty much dominate the political atmosphere, but represents only about 2 to 3% of the entire state. In terms and, of geography. Of geography. And, uh, and they're, they're looking at doing the same thing up there with mountain lions. They're going to take it as a county-by-county county issue instead of a state issue because they're not allowed to hunt mountain lions up there with, with hounds. <laughs> It's going to be fascinating to see how this plays out because the feds always have one thing as their big hammer, and that's money. Um, But the people who are living and existing on these lands are the ones who are going to make that determination long term. And I'm really curious to see what the end result is going to be. I mean, hopefully we'll all be around for at least a few more years to see how how this fight goes and who has a dog in the fight. All right, we're going to have a couple more messages from our sponsors. We'll be back. I'm sure all of you at this table know, and I know, but I'd like the listenership to know that on June the 19th, Governor Brewer signed HB 2551 into law. Now, not only are the feds facing county rebellion, individual rebellion, but now we have a state interest in this. And what HB 2551 says It clarifies the state authority and how it will enforce federal travel management rules regarding off-highway vehicle use on U.S. Forest Service or Bureau of Land Management lands. I want an opinion from each one of you. Charlie, you go first. You know what it does. Well, I think it's gotten a little out of control. We definitely need to be out there protecting the forest and some of the damage to the the habitat. But uh, it really seems to be happening overnight, and it wasn't real well thought out. Nope. Chris? Well, yeah, it, it, the, the whole travel management system, it, it's just so broken, you know, when, when everything is done forest by forest. And, and here as a hunter, especially like us with our TV show, I mean, we film all throughout the West. We have no idea the amount of research we have to do before we show up and actually film something and document it that we're not breaking a law. It's becoming, it's becoming just so restrictive, it's almost impossible to even – Live, hunt, and and, and 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 recreate on public land because, as a law-abiding citizen, you don't even know if you're breaking the law day to day. I mean, you could be breaking the law. You could go a hundred yards, and all of a sudden, you've got a new, you know, some other regulation in effect that they could write you a citation for, and you are now out of business because you broke some regulation that didn't exist here, but didn't exist here. Jimmy, well, some will view it as controversial. What uh the legislature has done and what the Game and Fish has desired to do with this bill. Uh, I think it's refreshing that the state says enough's enough. We have inconsistent policies from forest to forest. Well, we've got five different kingdoms <coughs> here in Arizona alone. We some are some have roads that are closed and some have roads that are open, and the emphasis is on one or the other, depending on which forest you're in. But from a hunter's standpoint, uh, game retrieval varies in all of them. Uh, shooting restrictions vary in all of them. So it it creates some pro- camping restrictions are different. And uh, the state said, you know, you're using us as our the enforcement tool, but you're not having us in the loop. You're not asking us what we think or you're not valuing our opinion when it comes to these forest-to-forest initiatives. And I think it's, it says to the, the, gover- the federal government, wait a minute, we'll, we'll enforce, but we're also going to be consistent from 
our standpoint as Game and Fish uh, law enforcement. I've taken a look at some of the things that they've done in the past, and, and I think here's the interesting aspect, and you hit it right on the head, Jim. That is is that the feds don't have near the manpower to enforce any of this massive legislation that they've put out. You have five separate kingdoms here, and you have five separate bases of rules that they've put, instigated. And as Chris, you said, if you're in one of those kingdoms and you do something that's not correct according to that kingdom, but it's okay in another kingdom, and they call out the state agency of our game and fish guys, they write, issue you a citation, you're hauled before the commission, you lose your license for five years. Not only that, you're off in 38 separate uh, states and uh, um, provinces in Canada. I mean, that's a huge impact. And it's very frustrating to you because you do all that traveling, but it's also very frustrating to the residents of the state. And as much problem as you have with it, we have with it. Part of what we're seeing, too, is is that it's a control issue. You can create all kinds of legislation, but if it's broken so badly that nobody can possibly enforce it, what are you going to do? Yeah, and the thing is so frustrating is, as sportsmen, too, is if I go there and I and I break one of these, these laws that we all know we can't even begin to understand – I lose again. I lose my ability to hunt in all these other contiguous states, yep. you know, throughout the United States. If you're if you're just out there camping and you break one of these rules, it's not like you can't. You don't lose those privileges. No, you know, you, you can go camping anywhere still. You just pay your little fine and you're off you go. So it's really a selective punishment system too. It's basically designed to punish sportsmen. You know, John, the uh, many sportsmen and and many people in general complain that uh, our Arizona game and fish wildlife managers aren't on the ground enough. They're subjected to too much paperwork. Their areas are too big. They've got all these other uh, issues on their plate. And then you throw in these this myriad of travel management rules, and you you look at some of the uh, wildlife management units that transcend a couple different forests, and that person then is charged with not only knowing the the rules that abide by the individual force that he or she is charged with uh, overseeing, but then they have to be on the ground looking out for these other rules that the Forest Service has implemented without really respecting the game and fish's opinion in some of this stuff. I think that was the big. I think that was the straw for the for the commission, the Arizona Game and Fish Commission, that broke their backs, and that was. They were told that here we have five separate kingdoms. You're going to enforce all five separate kingdoms. And by the way, you better do it the right way. And by the way, no, you don't have any input. And because the commission did attempt at some point in time to say, let's be a little bit more reasonable, particularly regarding big game retrieval. If you get a big bull down in a canyon and that bull, have, I mean, you could shoot it at the top of the canyon. It decides to run. No matter if it's fatal or not, you know, eventually it will be fatal. They go to the bottom of the canyon. You try and pull it out without any assistance of either pack animals or an off-highway vehicle. That meat's going to be wasted. Then you're subject to a violation because you did – it's wanton waste of game. I mean, no matter what your best intentions are, there's, there's always the, the – it's like a catch-22 that you can get caught in. And I, I suspect that a lot of the wildlife managers know – um, and they, that's what they're being directed with now is, is how do you enforce this? They want them to use common sense judgment on the ground rather than the, lit, the litany of things that each of these kingdoms is trying to establish. They're, going, they're not going to take a tape measure out and say you are now 31 feet off the road camping. You are in violation. They're going to use common sense. If somebody's 250 yards back into the woods, they've carved a whole tree path where they've cut trees and they've created a little road to get back to this primo uh, camping spot, they're going to be cited. But if they're doing normal things and if they're going to get big game, that's the issues that we're trying to address. Mm-hmm. So. You know, John, um, several, as we're sitting there having this discuss- discussion, I'm reflecting <laughs> back, and I think it was in 2006 I had a, a special bighorn game, uh, bighorn hunt up in Colorado, and I'd done most of my ATC riding in Arizona, never done much out of state, and I was absolutely blown away by the network of ATV trails that they've created up there. The signage was unbelievable. It told you where you could go and where you couldn't. And during that four months I spent up there, there was just a myriad of hunters using those ATC trails to access National Forest as well as recreational ATC guys. So I think we need a balance where you you need some 
some restrictions on some areas that are getting torn up, but as, but as you're taking away areas they can't ride in, I think they need to be developing a better ATV trail system, you know, open up some areas and, and restrict it to those areas, but give these guys enough enough room and enough uh, destinations where they can use their ATVs statewide. But uh, Colorado, in my opinion, it was just years ahead of Arizona. I, w- I was really impressed. John, what happened to our off-road uh, money from the sale of the sticker that started a couple years ago? We still have the OHV Game Rangers. I know they're out there. There's, I think there's more than seven now that finally came to fruition to do that. And they are issuing citations. I think that the way they handled it was appropriate. <laughs> The department wanted education first rather than enforcement, and they worked diligently for over a year and a half explaining to people what you could and could not do. And for most people, it's staying on trails. I mean, that's the easy part of it. I've seen people, and and we've all seen things that we say, no, that shouldn't be happening. When they're doing mud jumps in the middle of a dirt tank that's supplying critical water, but it's fun for them to go through that, that's wrong. When they're carving a path through a pristine area, going down into the bottom of a riparian area, that's wrong. But when they're using some existing roads and they're having fun and it's not what they call a cherry stem where it stops, but rather a circuitous system so people can go on a long ride, that's correct. It's common sense and people aren't, they have not been doing that. There's always bad apples that are going to do one way or the other. But I think the the ability to try and legislate that and then not be able to enforce it was critical. And that's what everybody's been screaming about. And I, I think the department's taking what I call a more even-keeled approach, as is the commission and as is the governor through this, saying we're going to enforce what we see as stupid behavior, but we're not going to find out and how, learn how to do all five of your kingdoms particular work. Now the question is, what is the response going to be from the feds on this? How are they going to respond to the states that are bucking the trend? And again, it's the same thing. The population centers of the east where they think they know how all of wildlife should be handled when they spend maybe one weekend a year camping at the Hilton that's outside of a pristine area, that's not reality. The reality is those people in the counties, the ranchers and all those people, the agricultural people who are trying to eke out an existence out there and then trying to determine their fate by the people who never set foot in it. At least, okay, that's the end of my soap opera. (laughs) So... um, we're talking about a number of things, but the biggest thing that we have right now going for us is this Mexican gray wolf. We see that we have the issues of uh, 100, that was the objective, the cost of the taxpayers of already over $25 million instead of $8 million, the ineffective handling of that, and the work within the agencies. We all know that between the San Carlos and the White Mountain Apache tribe, there's some substantial monies that have been given to these nations in order to maintain the existence of a wolf on the White Mountain Apache and in order not to have wolves on the San Carlos. The San Carlos Apache tribe gets, I think it's about $80,000 a year not to have Mexican gray wolves on their land. They have a biologist who basically goes around and makes sure that if they see wolf exhibit signs or if they see scat, that's what they're going to do. So we're going to discuss that in the next hour, and maybe we're going to be able to get the big bass daddy himself in here on the line. So we'll chat with him. I'm John McColazar. You are Charlie Kelly, Chris Denham, Jim Unmock. We'll be back. We're coming back. The big question that we all have in our minds right now, though, is we know where Don's at. He's out at the Scottsdale Princess filming some TV stuff. And his brother wants to know, how many laps is he doing in the water hazard? (laughs) That's the key question. I can just see the 150-acre pond that Don's taking his Big Bass Daddy rig all around. (laughs) It should be fun. We'll, we'll, We'll ask him about that later. All right, getting back to the the kingdom aspect of what the feds are trying to do versus states' rights versus county rights versus population centers making determinations. The Mexican gray wolf is our key concern. Um, Charlie, we've talked about how much money we're putting on the ground to sustain wildlife and how the feds are putting so much money on the ground to make sure that we feed their wildlife, not necessarily the ones that we want. Um, I question, and each of you has been out there enough, where would we be? without the $22.5 million on the ground projects that we've done over the past 30 years, where would Arizona's wildlife be? Take a shot, Charlie. Well, you know, John, I've probably spent most of my wildlife um, 
time on bighorn sheep more than any of the other species the last 10 years. And it's just a real success story. Um, without a lot of the work done by the Arizona Desert Bighorn Sheep Society, we wouldn't have nearly the herds of bighorn sheep we have here in Arizona, Arizona right now, um, as well as all the expanding populations of Rocky Mountain bighorn sheep. In fact, currently they're planning a transplant back into the White Mountain area near Springerville. And, uh, oh, some Rockies going in. Yep, yep. So they're going to reestablish a historic herd back in that area. So we've got these volunteer organizations spending time and money, raising money and spending do- uh, time getting these new herds established. And then if you turn around and, and expand the predators and give them another challenge to face, it just seems really counterproductive to me. Chris? Yeah, it's almost, it, it, to some, in some degrees, it's almost insulting. We talk about with the Super Raffle how we're going to raise a couple million dollars and and we, you know, all the other organizations, we're, we're talking about one, two, three million dollars and how significant that is, yet we're going to spend 25 million on wolves. That are going to eat. They're going to eat what, what we're, we're trying put, yeah. to establish. I mean, yeah. it's just, it, it, it just, it's almost, it's insane. It's almost insane when you really start thinking about it. Uh, you, you've got a struggle here with some people that absolutely abhor wolves, and you have some that say, you know, I, I don't want to see that species of wolf disappear. Gone forever. Gone no. forever. But yet, if you don't have state, the state wildlife management, state game and fish commission managing wildlife in Arizona, uh, you're not going to have the prey species respected like we think they ought to be. If the if the Arizona Game and Fish Commission was managing all wildlife, including the Mexican gray wolf, then you could play that and handle that such that you could have the Mexican gray wolf exist, but you wouldn't deplete your prey species. I agree with that. And I also think that we're going to have to take a look in the long term, and that is there's a specific name to this species. It's called the Mexican gray wolf. Eighty percent of its historic range was located in Mexico. My question is, why is this a simple United States issue rather than an international issue? If you're going to have a successful program, if the prey species and the historic range of this animal was 80 percent in Mexico, why do we not have a stronger influence and and a stronger designation from its historic range rather than what we're trying to do now? Well, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service has taken the lead role, uh, at least what we understand, uh, in trying to keep the Mexican gray wolf from going ex- extinct. Arizona Sportsman for Wildlife Conservation has called upon the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to uh, engage Mexico to a greater degree. I think it's a trilateral commission that has uh, in the past worked on joint efforts uh, for this very thing. And... Make sure that any plan that talks about sustainability or recovery has to include Mexico in it because a lot of the areas that uh, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service would like to target in the United States, be it New Mexico, Arizona, southern Utah, or extreme west Texas, uh, never had wolves in before. So we we want – we're asking the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to get Mexico on board full partner, and make sure that uh, the Mexico component is a critical piece in this whole equation. Well, I think I'd like to see an 80%. <clears throat> yeah, and you look at you know, those of us, I was I was raised down in Douglas on the Mexican border. I've spent a lot of time hunting in Mexico, and I can agree you, the, the, the Mexican people are going to go, what? You want what? Hey, just for those who always know, this is Roll Call. And the people who have sacrificed their lives over the past week. I hate doing this and I hate seeing the photos, but it gives us the opportunity to disagree as we currently do now. Roll call for September for June the 23rd. Army Specialist Ember M. Alt died June 18th, 2013, serving during Operation Enduring Freedom. She was 21 years old at Beach Island, South Carolina assigned to the 68th Combat Sustainment Support Battalion for the 3rd Sustainment Brigade, 4th Infantry Division out of Fort Carson, Colorado. Jai died June the 18th in Bagram, Afghanistan, of wounds caused by indirect fire. Also, John, um, the last week we lost Army Specialist Robert W. Ellis. 
He uh, was killed June 18th, 2013, serving during Operation During Freedom as well. Um, Robert was 21 and from Kennewick, Washington, and he was assigned to the 68th Combat Sustainment Support Battalion, 43rd Sustainment Brigade, 4th Inf- Infantry Division, Fort Carson, Colorado. And he died as well on June 18th in Bagram, Afghanistan, of wounds caused by indirect fire. We also had uh, Army Sergeant Justin R. Johnson. He died June 18th, 2013, serving during the Operation Enduring Freedom. Sergeant Johnson was 25 years old from Hope Sound, Florida. He was assigned to the 10th Transportation Battalion, 7th Sustainment Brigade, out of Fort Eustis, Virginia. Again, he died June 18th in Bahrain, uh, Afghanistan, of wounds sustained or caused by indirect fire. We also lost on June 18th, 2013, Army Specialist William R. Moody. He was serving during Operation Enduring Freedom. He was 30 years old out of Burleson, Texas. He was assigned to the 68th Combat Sustainment Support Battalion, the 43rd Sustainment Brigade, the 4th Infantry Division out of Fort Carson, Colorado. He died in Bagram, Afghanistan, of wounds caused by indirect fire. And finally, we have Marine Lance Corporal Jared W. Brown. Died June the 16th, 2013, serving during Operation Enduring Freedom. He's 21 year, 20 years old of Youngstown, Florida. Assigned to the 2nd Battalion, 2nd Marine Regiment, 2nd Marine Division out of Marine Expeditionary Force out of Camp Lejeune, North Carolina. He died June 16th while supporting combat operations in Helmand Province in Afghanistan. They gave up their lives for you. We'll be back. When a fly is brought to you by Bill Luke Dodge Chrysler Jeep. Now, here's your host, saltwater fisherman and tournament pro, Don McDowell. Uh, I don't see Don. No, you, you see the the more attractive version of Don. <laughs> Facsimile thereof. Facsimile thereof, sans de moulet. Yeah. <laughs> Good point. Those are big words right there, man. Wow. <laughs> What's he? He's supposed to be getting in a boat up at a resort or something, right? Yeah, he's in a boat out at the Scottsdale Princess Resort. And my question is, you can cover that moat or pond in less than three seconds with the Big Bass Daddy. I thought he was in a water hazard with his clothes. Well, well, here's the deal. They got some really smarmy people up there. I wonder how that's going to work out. (laughs) You know, there there is a lot to be said for that. This, I I wish I could film that and see how it processes. I was talking to the producer, Patrick, about that. Somebody's got to get that on film, baby, because that's going to be, that thing's going to go viral in a heartbeat. I wonder, can you see golf balls on a fish finder? (laughs) (laughs) Be fun. Oh, now that's classic. <laughs> I can just see a big bass daddy. Like, oh, look at that. Titleless. Titleless. It's got to be a pro V1 or who won't go out. Yeah. No, that's a fingerling. Uh, yeah, fingerling. All right. Well, Jimmy, you mentioned something during break, and I think it's important that you bring it up, so please do. Well, right before we went on the air this morning, we heard the New Jersey governor is uh, honoring a, an actor that just passed away here the other day by ordering all the state flags to go to half-mast here in the next day or week. And as we went through the roll call, it struck us that, uh, how ironic is that, that we're emulating an actor through a governor of a state, and we're sitting here, and we just read the names of five people that died last week. Yeah, and to, they died To help us country. in our freedom. Yep. And we thought that was just wrong. And I, I hope the population understands. I, I mean, I enjoyed The Sopranos. I thought it was a great series. I enjoyed James Gandolfino. I think he did a wonderful job. He was a character actor who did a marvelous job with it. But it's a matter of the balance of the recognition of what's really important in life and what's not. So mm-hmm. thanks for bringing Amen. that up. Yeah. All right. Going back to our favorite <coughs> woofy issue. Um, we know we're facing some serious questions, particularly as the expansion comes. We've all heard the, the, the nasty term metapax, and we know that the biologists are pushing for that out of Albuquerque. And Albuquerque, for those who don't know, is where the Fish and Wildlife Service Western Region is headquartered. Uh, Dr. James Tuggle and the staff and the biologists have all been meeting. And a metapack, their definition is 250 wolves per a metapack, and they want three of them to be existing. Now, that word leaked out over a year and a half ago. Um, we also know that they only have a 
approximately 300 Mexican rear wolves in captivity now. Obviously, these are from the seven pool that started over 20 some years ago. What do you think we're going to find when they release these? Chris, you've, you've experienced some of that. Uh, what, no, one more time, your question? The What are we going to experience? Because we've seen the ones that they released initially, they they don't know how to be wild. Oh, yeah. It, and they, they go immediately to the food trough, and when there's no food there, they're looking at and going, wait a minute. You mean we have to kill something? Yeah. They, we have to work for this? Yeah, they live along the highways picking up, you know, roadkill. Road kill. You know, then, uh, then head to the ranch. Yeah, mm-hmm. head to the ranches mm-hmm. where there's calves, you know, calves being born or cow, or cows in a pen, sheep in a pen, uh, dogs tied up to, you know, dogs that are tied up because they are not allowed to roam free, but because of, there's wolves in the area, but now they're tied to a chain, pretty easy pickings for a wolf. And, uh, it, and even on the bigger picture, you look at what happened up in the Northwest with the Yellowstone wolves. We, once, once that, once they're out of the box, we can't control them. Oh, no. You know, I talk to guys that hunt wolves up there, and they'll go two weeks before they even see a wolf. Yet they can determine that 80% of the, of the herds have been decimated in that country by wolves, but sportsmen rarely even see the wolves, you know, because they're so nocturnal. I mean, once we, once we let these wolves out of the box, we have completely lost control. You know, it's like thinking that we're going to be able to control coyotes, you know, when they're running around North Scottsdale. Ever it's since 1992, happen. we can't do it. We can't no. do a thing with them. No. I mean, we stopped trapping on public lands, and that basically was the Pandora's box opening. Yeah. And yeah. I just see it as being even worse now. No management tools. Charlie, how about you? You've been up on the round. Well, you know, going back, I, I think you stuck on a good point last hour, John. We need um, to do something to protect all the money and, and manpower that's been expended the last 40, 50 years here in the state. A, a tremendous amount of these wildlife projects, they're funded by some of these special programs. But the lion's share of the cost is is man hours that are donated by volunteers. Yeah. You know, and I, and I was – up at a meeting, commission meeting last weekend, and Ty Suplee, a former game branch chief, was there talking about the Arizona Antelope Foundation and what they raised for their antelope tags last year. And they took that money and in turn got matching funds for the federal government and doubled the amount of money that they raised for those tags. And that was just for materials that will be spent on these antelope projects. Um, the lion's share of, of the expense is spared because it's done with volunteer hours. Arizona Antelope Foundation, like the other wildlife group, groups, has got a tremendous pool of volunteers that work year long, oh, um, I look working at for wildlife. And then, and I'm yeah. frustrated because these these people, these organizations that are out supporting the wolf, the expanding range of the wolf, I don't see these guys out on the ground, you know, like the rest of us helping the other species of wildlife. It's it's just not an equal equal playing field and I, I think the public needs to wake up to that they're in the courtroom and in the newspaper john and charlie yeah you're right jim <laughs> yeah i i think that's the biggest thing and i also i have a real fear that um the determining factor has always been a majority of the population it's a vote i don't think anybody who's never been or set foot in a national forest on a hunt or a work project should be allowed to vote <laughs> on the determination of what's going on on that land. I, I Seriously, you think about that. We've all worked on projects. We've all gotten our hands dirty on the ground. We've all been involved with the understanding it. I mean, good Lord knows the miles we've all driven and donated. I mean, either that or let's just submit a bill to the United States government and say, okay, we raised $22.5 million on these game tags. The hours that went in is at least three times as much because we donate our on-the-ground efforts as well as the time promoting these things, as well as the time working on the banquets. And here's the $22 million. Let's just get us back our $88 million. Each of the board will divide that, and we'll all go live somewhere where it's nice. How ironic you talk about $22.5 million, what, over the last 40 years? 30 years. 30, 30 years. Yeah. Uh, Across the the whole range of species, game species, and you know the projects, candidly that uh, sportsmen volunteer to work on, aren't limited to just game species. They, oh no, they there's no sign at the waterhole that says only sheep can drink here or only antelope can drink here. I mean, all species of wildlife go to those waterholes and utilize those habitat enhancements that we've we're all worked on. But when you talk about 22 and a half million over 30 years. During, how ironic! During the same time period, we spent twenty-five million on seventy-eight animals. It was the designated. federal government spent twenty-five million, 
and we have 75 or 78 official animals in the count. And we've we've worked for 30 plus years, sportsmen, and spent about the same amount of money. It doesn't include all the the thousands and thousands of volunteer hours that we've added to that mix. But the money's been the same, and we've had a heck of a lot more success. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah well, when you, you know, when you really think about that, in Arizona, could it, could it be <clears throat> billions of dollars? I mean, when you look at at, at excise tax money and and uh, from the state, from uh, sportsman dollars raised to create an environment of, uh, that's friendly to to the prey species that allows these predators to be here. I mean, really, we've been we're, we're, we've we've spent so much time and money and effort to to develop habitat so that prey species can survive, so that these they could they could have the privilege of of trying to bring wolves into it. John, here's the here's a bigger picture perspective in a in a minute or two. We've talked about the Mexican gray wolf, which right now is confined to a small area in the northeast in northeast part of Arizona and south northwest part of New Mexico. But throw in, if you will, the concerns about the jaguar across the southern third of Arizona. Throw in the ocelot across the bottom counties of Arizona. Throw in the condor that's currently in a 10J area on the north rim of the Grand Canyon. Uh, throw in the desert tortoise. Throw in all the fishes that uh, native Humpback fishes. Job. Throw in all the the snails and everything else that these environmental groups want to protect. And if you overlay all those habitat areas for these animals, that's the entire state of Arizona except downtown Phoenix, maybe. And that, folks, is where we're going to start seeing all of our hunts downtown Phoenix. <laughs> this is John Colazar, Charlie Kelly, Chris Denham, Jim Unmock. We'll be back about how we're going to hunt big game elk in downtown Phoenix. Oh, yeah. Mellow. Tell me, Chet, do we have the big bass daddy himself on the line? Wolfman gon' get you, baby. Yeah, he's with us, man. Hey, I like the idea of hunting elk in downtown Phoenix. What a concept. (laughs) <laughs> we're gonna get, we're gonna have to ur- issue urban urban camouflage. We'll have little signs and windows painted. We'll have a little graffiti on the side. Yeah, yeah. Deck Park Tunnel will be a walking only area. <laughs> <laughs> That's like looking for golf balls over at the Princess. Yeah, you finding those on your fish finder there, Don? Oh uh, yeah, buddy. I tell you what, you know they've got it going on fish wise. There's a uh, three and a half pound bass over here. It's just driving me nuts. So. Oh, don't tell me you're fishing. Uh, yeah, I will be here in a few minutes. You know, you just have to test the venue. At the turn, yeah. he's going to fish. At, <laughs> At the, the turn. turn. Okay, after the front nine, is that it? Yeah, actually, we're uh, right on the back. Uh, let's see, we're on uh, hole number four on the uh, TPC. So, <sighs> pretty interesting. But I, I wanted to share with everybody, hey, the yellowtail is lighting up over in California, guys. Ooh. Uh, Ooh. The, the big mass of uh, biomass of uh, tuna have kind of put their noses down the last few days. Uh, last week, if you recall, they were catching 50 to 150 pound class bluefin tuna, which is a bonus. Uh, Avocar, real, real sporadic unless you're on a two and a half day trip. But I'll tell you, these guys are whacking yellowtails uh, just right and left. Yep. Basically, what 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 they're doing is they're out uh, jumping patties. Ah. Uh. Uh, you know, it's like us sitting on a stock tank. You know, they find a patty and uh, kind of ambush it and go to town. And, and quite frankly, the yellowtail are uh, a fairly good grade, uh, 25 to 35 pound class. Nice. That's a good fish. Yeah. That that represents a few meals. Are any of those on hole number eight? Oh, uh, yes. <laughs> yeah. That'd be, that'd be the 19th hole. <laughs> All kidding aside, Don, are you having a good time out there this morning? Uh, yeah, John. It's uh, any of these uh, big events are uh, a lot of work, but uh, I'm I'm really proud to be able to represent the Arizona National Guard and work with these guys in the uh, fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh. Uh, they're putting on their third annual Freedom Festival. It's uh, recognizing uh, past and present military folks for uh, the sacrifices and all the things that they do, uh, so we can do all the things that we do. Uh, we've got the um, Military vehicles, uh, guys coming out, we'll have some uh, Ural motorcycles, uh, Jeeps, 
Uh, the M35A2 will be parked right in the front entrance of the uh, resort. And then, uh, I don't know if this has ever been done before, but we're actually putting the uh, shake, rattle, and troll National Guard boat in the lagoon. <laughs> Good uh, job. Uh, right in the middle of the resort. Uh, we'll be doing uh, fishing seminars daily, and uh, right after the fishing seminar is over with, uh, we have a shake, rattle, and troll fishing derby for the folks. <laughs> And uh, they're allowed to weigh all the fish they catch and keep upgrading uh, as their fish get bigger. For biggest and, fish of the day? Yeah, biggest fish of the day. We have an adult division and a uh, children division, which we've already got J.K. signed up for. <laughs> so, yeah, I happen to know that, you know, he's not a juvenile delinquent, but he does stay at the Holiday Inn. <laughs> I'll tell you what, it sounds awesome, but please do not fire up the engines on your Big Bass Daddy boat. I mean, you'll drain the lake in one one little push. Well, I, yeah, we, we were talking. I'm going to have to fire the big motor to get it off. Uh, it's uh, from what uh, Master Sergeant Major tells me, it's about four feet deep. So <laughs> uh, I, I equate horsepower to depth, that's about a 40-foot rooster tail. <laughs> 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 and all the all the people who you're trying to teach how to bass fish are going to feel like they've been in an early monsoon shower. When you do that, does that suck up the golf balls down there in the pond? Uh, I would imagine it's really going to annoy the fish. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes, the patrons out at the resort might be a Patrons, yes. Uh, you know, the bass boat's not a big deal, but uh, this M35A2 has uh, wrinkled some eyebrows this morning with these... Uh, Scott still folks trying to sleep in, so. Oh, Don, 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 Don. Oh, oh, that's just so right. I'm um, thank you. Yeah, it, it's all good, but I'd encourage anybody, if, you know, if they want to come hang out. They have fireworks every night, and it's uh, a, music, uh, spas, pools, bars, floating bars, standing up bars. John, you can probably lay down and drink if you want to, so. And, you know, I, I can pass on that image. Thank you very much. Yeah. You, on the other hand, I know could do that. Yeah, buddy. Well, this is a five-star resort, and it's uh, really a beautiful place. And, uh, uh, you know, Daiichi Hooks uh, has sent some uh, hooks out. Uh, Ronnie Park from Lake Fork Tackle's got uh, stuff on the way to show uh, folks how to fish. We'll, we'll be going over uh, Larry the Lizard, uh, Killer Lizard baits with a rattle in them. So. You know, something I, really I, profound about um Larry the Lizard being out at the Scottsdale Princess Resort. With a rattle in it. <laughs> With a rattle. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's all good, man. All yeah. right, Don. Well, thank you very much for calling in. I appreciate it. But you know what? Thanks to the Scottsdale Princess for doing that with the National Guard. I think it's it's awesome that they're recognizing everybody on that holiday, as well as the fact that you're taking the time to be out there as well. Uh, it sounds yeah, like it's going to yeah. be a heck of a good time. You know, we're, we're going to thank them. Uh, we'll be doing uh, Voice of Veterans out here uh, on the 4th of July. We'll be, be doing uh, Shake, Rattle, and Troll. And hopefully uh, we don't have roll call. Uh, it's just uh, it's getting deeper and deeper every week we go along. So. Sadly, you're right. All right, guys. Great job. Hey, we'll see everybody up in Springerville at the Predator uh, Symposium Friday. Uh, what's, what time is that? Six o'clock. Like, Six o'clock. Six o'clock. I will be there. All right, I'll join you, Big Bass Daddy. All right, Roger that, guys. Thanks. Have a good day. Good job. Bye, Don. Bye, Don. You know, there's something real wrong about us being here in studio and him being out there on the water. How well, he's, you... he's on the golf course right now. Oh, that's right. That's right. The golf course, yeah. <laughs> the then he'll be on the water, but it's still wrong. I agree with you. They yeah. probably have a Starbucks cart out there, too. <laughs> oh, I bet they do. Yeah. The carts out there have Starbucks in them. <laughs> yeah. That's the key. All right, we're going to try and get back into it a little bit. Let's see where we're going now. In terms of what we see next Friday, I'm, I'm interested in what you guys think is going to happen. I mean, I, I see this as being just one of the biggest chaotic messes I've ever seen. Well, I think it's going to – what the counties are doing, I think, is going to throw a wrench into the plans of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Oh, yeah. And I talked to Doyle the other day on the phone, and he indicated that they're – their plan's all already underway in Apache County, and other counties are following suit. But uh, they're full steam ahead, and uh, I'm not sure, he, and he didn't elaborate on it, but not sure what the feds are going to do about it. It's like anything else. I mean, we've seen in, in the state of Arizona, we've had fights on immigration forever. 
and there has been the inability to enforce for decades. Well, what are they going to do now on something as trivial, uh, I mean, to them, as wildlife and camping? I mean, they're going to expand the manpower to do that? And you and I both know that Forest Service personnel, 60% of their income is achieved in a 30 or 90-day period, three months during the fire season. When those guys get the calls and they have to play hot shots or they have to do you know fire jumps and they have to run equipment back home, that's where all those guys make all their overtime money. They don't want to work during the dead of winter. They don't want to hunt. During, they want to go out hunting during the fall. They don't want to be out there doing all that stuff. What, who's going to enforce all this stuff? That's where they were trying to lean on the state agencies and the Game and Fish Department. And I think this kind of sends a message as well to the Fed saying, you know what? You better rethink this because you can't enforce it. Why have a law if you can't enforce it? Yeah, most people think that everybody that it, driving around the forest in a green truck is an enforcement person. Uh-uh. And they're just not. I mean, the Forest Service has a very... A very limited budget and a very small percentage of their personnel are actually dedicated to law enforcement or have even have the ability to cite somebody for an infraction. You know, I was stopped one time outside of Big Lake for raising dust levels in my truck. And it was after I'd spent a full day on a project up at Big Lake where we were removing uh, barbed wire. And we were rolling barbed wire all day long and it was late and I had to get back jumped in the truck and i'm starting to take off and here's law enforcement i thought oh my god of all the times i have never in my life seen a law enforcement personnel from the apache sitgraves and here i run into the one he pulls me over and wants to talk with me and then as it turns out he had a trainee that he was Mm -hmm. showing the ropes this is how you do it it's the first time he's pulled that thing out of his pocketbook in eons well how did he figure that you were raising too much dust on a gravel road objective subjective Subjective determination. Yeah. Now, this is the United States of America, and you got pulled over for driving down a dirt road, raising dust, dust. Yeah. as if it was a, you had a choice. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Again, this all points to he was the only guy within probably 200 square miles that had the word law enforcement on his truck. There's nobody else. I mean, you can't possibly do that kind of thing. But I, I think that in terms of the Mexican gray wolf, I think that if they expand that, I want to see the reaction of the public, and we're going to talk to Mr. Guggenhauer in about 15 minutes, and we're going to, we'll are going we know a whole lot more then as to what's going to happen, where are we going to go, how are the residents of Scottsdale, because quite frankly, we're in the release zone expansion area. I mean, I don't think Scottsdale and Paradise Valley are going to be real happy when they find out that Fluffy and Little Bingo the cat are gone, and they're gone because the wolf took them. The other thing, too, is we've seen crossbreeding over in the east that we don't see yet, and it hasn't occurred yet. But I'll be willing to bet that as time goes by, we're going to see some crossbreeding between coyotes and the Mexican gray wolves. Oh, absolutely. Have and you dogs. seen anything up north? No, I have not heard about it up north. I think those those wolves are, you know, compared to our wolves, those are real wolves. Oh, yeah, those are huge. Yeah, 120 pounds, everything, you know, 120, 140 pounds. Everything's a, everything's a meal first. Uh, but, uh, yeah, and, and our wolves down here, I mean, they're pen-raised. Every yeah. one of them is is has been generated from a pen raised wolf. Yeah, in the crossbreeding between dogs and coyotes, it's inevitable. I would suspect that. I mean, it's got to happen. I, when you well, it's know. already happened, I know they they had to destroy a couple litters that they determined were crossbred from from dogs. Oh, really? Yeah. I mean, early on, they've already had to. It's already happened. I also know that one of them wandered so far out of the zone. Um, you know that the I mean, it was supposed to be in that blue primitive area. And one got whacked outside of Flagstaff across from the Ralston Perina dog child plant. <laughs> That's where one of them died. That's documented about six years ago. You know, unfortunately, it went a long way for that dog food. Yeah. <laughs> I thought that was a secret. <laughs> Down prevailing winds. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, the downwind burn. No, I, I think that it's going to be interesting to see where we go in the future with this, who's going to be doing the enforcement, and... I think the other thing is is how much publicity it won't get because the feds don't want anybody to know about it. Mm-hmm. I think it's going to be a dirty little secret. Arizona is weird. Let them do what they want. We're not going to talk about this. And I think that that's a possibility of where we might wind up going. Mm-hmm. So we're going to see what happens. I, I'm I'm hoping, you know, God willing, the creek don't rise. We'll all be here to see the end result of this. I'm John Colazar. I'm Charlie Kelly. Chris Dettel. Jim Unmock. More words from our sponsors, and we'll be back. Nice. 
heavy downbeat to take us up to pace in Arizona. Mr. James Guggenhauer, good morning, James. How are you? I'm doing well, John. How are you doing this morning? Well, uh, the alternate bass in the box waiting for uh, the big bass daddy to have some fun out at the Scottsdale Princess. But uh, I'm sitting down in studio. You are up in beautiful downtown Pace in Arizona. And we're talking about wolves again today. Yes, I've been listening uh, through the website about the conversation. And, you know, just I think you hit the nail on the head just a little bit ago that how do you enforce something like that? It's just impossible to be done. Well, what's the attitude of Payson now? I know it's been shaking around up there for the last two weeks, ever since the Big Bass Daddy went and stirred the waters. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, to the to the town council, and we've been talking with Cameron Davis. He's the uh, director of Parks, Recreation, and Tourism up here. So we're trying to lay a plan. But uh, you'll recall, I think we talked about it on the show last year, that it was a bald eagle that came down and took a dog right out of Green Valley Park and literally he took the leash out of this woman's hand and flew away with her dog. I can just imagine what's going to happen when a wolf wanders down there to get some water. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that would be an area. And then you you know, of course, that if the, if the wolf program is very successful, I'm starting the grizzly bear recovery team, then we're going to have our first release site going to be somewhere outside of Payson, Arizona, so that it can take care of the black bears that are the nuisance bears. Well, Johnny, bears. that's not funny because there's some environmentalists in this state that would like to see the grizzly bear come back to Arizona. Ain't going to happen in our lifetime. All right, James. Tell us what's going on in the, in the nice, wonderful, non-confrontational world of fishing up on the big lakes. All right, Will. Thank you. Hey, we're going to start off this morning with the uh, Bassmaster Elite Bass Fishing Tournament in La Crosse, Wisconsin. They're fishing the Mississippi River this week. We had four Arizona anglers uh, that are fishing, and they did quite well. Oh, cool. Who did what? Starting out, we have Clifford Perch. I knew it. Who made, the, who made the third day cut. He is actually fishing as we speak for the championship in that tournament. Uh, but we also had Josh Bertrand, who finished 18th. Dean Rojas finished 19th. And Mr. John Murray was 26th. So good checks for all those guys and uh, great showing for Arizona on there. We're, we're kind of all pulling for Clifford. Oh, congratulations to him, and I hope Clifford does well. Uh, do good. Uh, the other thing is, last night here in Payson, we were treated to a spectacular moon. Oh, yeah. And uh, a lot of the local guys definitely were out on Roosevelt Lake last night. It was almost like daylight out there. Guys were using spinner baits at night. Uh, it was so light. And uh, a lot of good reports coming in. Uh, we'll have to get uh, some later updates and get some reports next week. But uh, bass fishing overall was called good this past week. There's still a good bit of uh, post-spawn bass that are chasing shad on the surface. But that bite is slowing down. That's, that's traditionally something that happens in the May and June time frame. And then as summer uh, uh, gets a little warmer, uh, that bite kind of dies down and as the spawn for the shad kind of ends. But we did get good reports this past week on a Texas rig and a Carolina rig. And a lot of guys are using green baits, and a green six-inch lizard has been very popular. Uh, How deep down? Pardon me? How deep are they going? Right now, most guys are fishing on main lake points, Uh, so points that stick out into the main channel there. And they're fishing in 15 to 25 feet of water. Uh, this is also a perfect depth for a drop shot technique, um, and that guys are using a morning dawn and a camo color robo worm. A weightless Cinco also works very well in, in those water conditions. But if you just kind of drive by the lake and kind of take a look at where those boats are sitting, you'll see most of them, you know, a third of the way into the cove or out to the main lake point. That seems to be the, the best places. Following the topo maps, following the points out into the middle of the channels. Then, okay. There you go. <laughs> that's that's where that's where they're going to be. Now, I I did read a report about uh, a very good local angler that was fishing right after dark, and he said he had a good jerk bite, uh, jerk bait uh, bite going the last couple of nights. And I'll bet you with that full moon last night that he was doing uh, pretty well up there. Oh yeah. 
I don't doubt that. It was a brilliant full moon early. Yeah. Now, the crappie bite uh, was called fair pat this past week. Um, that full moon last night, I uh, didn't get any proper reports this morning, but I'll bet you it made a, a good difference in, in a lot of them. And fishing on the, on the rim for trout, uh, you know, I, I told people here in Payson yesterday, and I'll tell the Valley listeners, if you haven't gone up to one of the rim lakes this spring for some trout fishing, you need to make some plans because it's just over-the-top fishing up there. And I hate to even recommend a bait because I heard that anything is working. Uh, whatever you like to fish with, uh, you'll pretty much catch trout on the rim lakes. And even the fly fishermen, you know, they're, now we're starting to get insects on the top of the water. Yep, the, the so hatches. You want to match the hatch, you know, whatever whatever you see going there. Uh, crick hoppers, because we have a lot of uh, crickets up there now, um, guys are just killing them up there. So if you're a trout fisherman anyway, you need to need to stop by up there. You have usually on the trout, it's early, early morning, right at first day, daylight and late, right? Uh, two prime times, yes, especially if you're stream fishing. You know, if you can find an overhang that's got a little pool by it, I can absolutely guarantee you there are going to be trout in there. And either a small spinner or a power bait or a woolly bugger kind of fly, um, you know, first light or last light, uh, they'll, they'll absolutely be feeding in those areas. James, what's the stocking procedure now for the department? I mean, do they stock weekly, biweekly? Do you know what the pattern is up there? Yes. They, they rotate uh, the lakes that they go to, so most every week they are doing some stocking. But each individual lake, they do about every other week. Ah, okay. And But then when the water temperature, like here in Payson at Green Valley Park, now they have stopped the, it's the too uh, hot. stocking here, yes, because it gets warm. And uh, they'll resume again in the September time frame. But up on the rim, they don't have that issue. And some of the, I mean, all the Hagler Creeks, the East Verde, you know, they all get stocked uh, all through the summer. So some great fishing reports being up there. Do they do they stock woods and willow on alternating weeks, or do they hit them at the same time? Uh, alternating weeks. Interesting. John, I was going to chime in real quick, too, and ask him if he had any information on when they uh, – when and if they stock Blue Ridge Reservoir, my, my son was up there kayaking yesterday. When I talked to him last night, I asked him how the fishing was, and he said one of the rangers said it hadn't been stocked yet this year. Is there some truth to that? Hmm. You know, I don't recall seeing Blue Ridge on the list, but I can't say that for sure. But uh, that, may, that may be accurate. And uh, now why, I, I can't answer that. It's, that's traditionally one of the good trout lakes up here. Well, you're our go-to guy. You know that. We need to know all this stuff. <laughs> I'll, I'll be doing some research as soon as we get off the phone here. <laughs> and just so you know, I want you to keep this in mind. In the future, there's going to be a genetic strain of wolf that is going to want to fish. It's going to go after trout, and it's going to go after big bass. And I want yeah. you to be aware of that. So just so you know, the development stages are already in planning by the Fish and Wildlife Service to have a fish-eating wolf. So you guys better be prepared up there, James. Uh, hey, let me add uh, one more thing. Uh, on the Shaker Island Troll website, if you look under trips, uh, you'll see a, a location up at Rivers Inlet called Duncan V. Lodge where we go salmon and halibut fishing. And we've had uh, the owner, Sid Kay, on the uh, last couple of years. And I know that there's people as far away as Washington that listen in to the radio show here. So uh, Mike and Carol Maddich are up there, and we're planning our trip to uh, go out in July back up to Duncan Bee. We're really looking forward to getting uh, up there and do some salmon and halibut fishing. All right, James, thank you so much for your time, as always, every Sunday. We appreciate it. We'll be back. gentlemen here we go we're down the home stretch we're getting ready to call it today for those of you who had the opportunity to hear us today i encourage you to go to shake rattle and troll website the there you can see some of the pictures of the famous and the infamous as well as some of the things that we do where we're at what we're doing what we're trying to become involved with um 
certainly there's a vast myriad of things that the Big Bass Daddy himself does, and we appreciate all of that. Um, we're going to finish up. We're going to try and come to some conclusions. So I'm going to start with you, Mr. Unmuck. You're the chief of the panel here regarding the legislative prospects for stopping the Mexican gray wolf expansion. I'm not sure there is a solution to stop it legislatively. Uh, or in court. Well, not sure necessarily it can be stopped in court either. It's been on the ground and it's been in an experimental 10J area for the last 15 plus years. Oh, I don't think we dis- we don't have any dispute with the ones that are here now. It's no. just the expansion that no, I'm concerned exactly. with. Uh, any move that falls short of uh, implementing as many metapacks as possible will obviously be brought to court by uh, the environmental protectionist organizations. They'll file suit to make sure that uh, this animal is perpetuated to the nth degree, notwithstanding the border and notwithstanding the, the name Mexico and its uh, and its name. No, they we Arizona specifically will have to be the savior, according to the enviro litigant groups. Exactly. Uh, because sportsmen have historically been toothless. Uh, if sportsmen decide to coalesce and uh, put up a fight with what they believe in, uh, maybe that can be changed. And maybe we can perpetuate uh, an experimental population to let the species live uh, and not go extinct, but by the same token, not have Arizona become the uh, the area that is known for Mexican gray wolves and no elk and no deer and no ungulates and no prey species. You're talking about a balance that makes sense, Jimmy, and I, I, I question <laughs> because of it. I think that ultimately we need to have the balance spectrum in the middle, but because of the strength and power that the Litigant community has, particularly the Center for Biological Diversity and the Sierra Club and Defenders of Wildlife, Humane Society of the United States with billions with a B of backing. Uh, I think that those are issues that we're going to have some troubles with. And I think in that regard, sportsmen have to research and look into what can we do using the same model that these organizations are using to counter that. I agree. And I hope I hope that we come up with what we call a winner that starts the process yeah. for us. We've mm-hmm. never gone to court. We it's 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 deemed as something that is ugly, nasty, and no hunter sportsman wants to become involved in that process. Um, but I think it's time we have to. I I think absent that we're going to get steamrolled. Yeah. Chris, um, I think we're really not to. Just not to take away from the, the political side at all, but for those sportsmen out there that aren't going to be involved in the political process, you, you've got to be involved in something. I mean, you've got to stay involved. And in, in just like we can't lose sight of the fact that the wildlife management is a big, big picture. Right. And wolves are a part of that. And we I need agree. to fight that. But at the same time, if we, we've, got, we've got to stay focused on the entire on the big picture and not our let not our, let ourselves be completely distracted by the wolf itself and make sure that we we start we continue to look at winter range uh, habitat improvements things that we can continue to do but because really when it comes to these political battles and these court battles it's being it's going to be fought by a small number of people of they course. need to be well financed. Yes, they do. So, you, so if you're not going to be involved in that process, at least contribute your money to that process and give your time to to habitat improvement projects or whatever, but you've got to be involved. Well, Charlie, you've got an opportunity for people to get involved. And not only that, we have a super big game drawing raffle coming up, don't we? We sure do, John. Um, this year's drawing will be held at the Outdoor Experience for All Banquet. It's going to be held here in Chandler, I believe, Chris. Chandler. Chandler, yeah. On uh, Saturday night, June thirteenth. Anybody? July. Can, oh, I'm sorry. July. You're correct. July. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me. Yeah, uh, he's done that twice now. I, he catches us making that. misstatements, <laughs> doesn't he? I think this is the third year we partnered with them, and and the banquet itself is awesome. I'm always look forward to just going to the banquet itself, and we do the drawing for the super raffle uh, during dinner. It's always really exciting. Uh, last year we had a lot of non-residents that won and we had a lot of residents upset about it 
And I, I want the residents to get upset about to realize the reason a lot of non-residents won is they sent a lot of their non-resident money into Arizona where 100% of it stayed. So, you know, there's there's something to be said for that. But hopefully the, the residents get the share of the tags. They usually win at least half of them or more every year. I know. That when we make those phone calls at night, and particularly when we go back east, it's hilarious to hear some of those calls. Uh, I'm glad we're able to capture some of those moments with people. But it would be nice if, yes, an elk tag or a mule deer tag was uh, happened to find its way into an Arizona residence. It hand. would be great, John. How many pieces do you think we – how many tickets have we sold, do you know? You know, I should know that. I don't. Um, our recent mailing went out to 147,000 people around the country about you know the two post- weeks ago. Yeah, the postage on that was a pretty penny, wasn't it? It was. It was. Our deadline this year, uh, I believe it's uh, July 5th for mail-in orders and uh, Sunday night, which is probably the 8th or 9th of July. I don't have a calendar in front of me, but you can order online through our website, and that's www.ArizonaBigGameSuperRaffle.com. It's a long one, but you'll find it on there. I encourage anybody that would like to take a chance to win with these awesome tags. And, and by the way, like those elk tags and mule deer tags we were talking about that sold for 300,000, 300, 250,000 for mule deer. When you win a tag like that through the super raffle that you pay $25 for, it's the same exact hunting privileges as those select few people that can afford those quarter of a million dollar tags. Absolutely. And, and the season's a year long. You can hunt basically most of the whole state for a year long. Usually hunt. it starts August the 15th or the 16th and it goes for one full year. Correct, John. So you're August out before 15th. everybody and you can finish up before anybody starts. So If you look at the track record from the last uh, seven years, most of the hunters have harvested just some unbelievable trophy animals. So it's definitely the hunt of a lifetime. And even if you don't win, you're supporting uh, wildlife conservation in the state of Arizona. Unless we keep putting money on the ground, we're not going to raise and, and promote hunting in Arizona and, and keep it there for future generations. So it's really an important program. I encourage everybody to participate. Well, thank all of you guys for coming in today. I really appreciate it. And I also want to mention one more time that if you go to our website, the shake, rattle, and troll.com, you'll see all the things that we're involved with, all the pictures and all the opportunities there are for improving things in Arizona and listening to the show and what we're trying to promote, um, the benefits of both fishing as well as hunting now. Um, you guys are all plans for uh, the 4th of July? Oh, yeah, yeah not. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> well, that's really good. Jim. I appreciate that. I plan on being in Anchorage, Alaska. Are you really? Yeah, actually, I'll be in Seward, Seward on the on the fourth, and they they do their far, fireworks at twelve oh one a.m. Oh, that's way cool. Yeah, it's gonna be fun. All right, the rest of us are gonna be probably down in the heat, or maybe up into the high country. <laughs> Birthday party in Iowa. <laughs> Ooh, no humidity there this time of year either. No, 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 no. Nice choice, Jimmy. <laughs> no mosquitoes either. All right, Charlie, you. I'm gonna be here in town. I've loaned my cabin out, so I'm gonna be enjoying the hundred and ten degree plus heat, but. Uh, that's our wrap-up week before the drawing for the Super Raffle. So there was a lot of, always a lot of last-minute things to get done. The hard part is, I, I mean, how many tickets did we sell? Do you have any idea? Gosh, you keep asking me that, John, and, and I, I'm embarrassed to say I don't know. You know, but we, last year, last year we had like 200,000 tickets that we yeah, had to tear it's, down. It's 140, um, 100, oh, excuse me, 425,000 or more dollars, and the tags. Tickets range in from five dollars up to twenty five dollars. So roughly eighty thousand ticket bursts. Oh yeah, yeah, huge garbage bags. I've got all of those bursting. tickets. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The bursting I don't mind so much. It's the folding them in half and making sure that we don't do fifty two pickup and they always go into the right bag and everybody has to take their separate bag and put them in because literally they're garbage bags filled with these raffle tickets that we put into these big drum rollers that we roll and draw the tickets from. So and we real real quickly talked about the Swarovski Optics raffle we do every year. This year's raffle um, has more equipment than we've ever included before. It's worth almost thirteen thousand dollars. Uh, it's unbelievable the amount of equipment you get, uh, state-of-the-art optics equipment for hunting. And those tickets are only $10 a piece, John. So I encourage people to get involved with that, too. Somebody's even even I can do that one. I know I can do that one. Yeah. Th- those frosty optics are just um, – it's like top of the world. You know that. Yeah. And so. even, you, you know, just being in the application business for a long time, you look at the odds of, like, a $100 investment in the sheep 
in the sheep tag, yep. you actually have a decent chance, probably as be- good a chance as you do if this is the first time you've applied for sheep in the state drawing. Oh yeah. So I mean, these are these these odds, as big as they sound, they're still better a lot of times than the state drawings are. You know, that's going to be. I mean, that's the one thing is that you, and uh, it's incredible for people to realize this, but be able to hunt 365 days to be out 30 full days before anybody else gets a chance and to have the whole year to glass them coming in so that you know you're the only person out there hunting mm-hmm. or one of three. Uh, and actually now this year we know the guy who bought the elk raffle tags, he bought both of them. So he's the one. One individual paid $595,000 to make sure he was the only person hunting a bull elk. And my guess is I know where he's at hunting this year. <laughs> Ruber has it, but I, I, I have sworn to secrecy, so to speak. So, um, thank you guys for coming down again. Appreciate all the time that you guys have put into this. Um, certainly, Jim, I, I think that we're going to find out a whole lot Friday up in uh, in Springerville. Are you planning on going up to that one? Uh, hope so. Hope so. Want to hitch a ride? <laughs> Maybe. I think the Prius can handle both of us. I don't know if I go in the Prius. Oh, come on. <laughs> Nobody wants to ride in it. It's not that bad. The vibration levels are down. The battery pack. It's the are... image. <laughs> oh, that's true. Image is everything. I, I've abandoned that. I've humiliated myself <laughs> enough times. I've pulled into enough parking lots with a Prius and been abused by people that it's just pathetic at this point. <laughs> However, oh, yeah. the Tundra still does roll on occasions. So, guys, thanks a lot for coming. I appreciate it. Any parting words? CD? See, stay involved, folks. Stay involved. It's one thing I've really seen myself this past year. I've gotten a little bit distracted with work. Even sitting here talking today, I realize how kind of unplugged I've become and how important it really is. So stay involved. Get involved with your local conservation organizations. Buy some super raffle tickets. But stay involved. All right, as Dan, Dandy Don always says, hug your bass boat and give your kids a kiss. Have a great weekend.